Should be should be a fun night. So go Irish.
Lord be with you. And your spirit. This evening we are gathered to open our hearts to the Word of God and to be mindful of how the Spirit of God has been given to each one of us. And that Spirit comes to us with wisdom. Wisdom that we are to share with one another. Wisdom that is to inform how we live our lives. So as we begin, we're going to listen to a, a short scripture. And we open our hearts to that scripture because it tells us God's hope for how we can be. God's hope for us. And then after that, we're going to move into this ritual communication to build our sense of communion as a communion, as a community of faithful hope. So to prepare us to open our hearts to the word, to prepare, to begin, to create a listening ears and listening heart. Let us take a moment to just calm ourselves, to quiet our thoughts, to leave behind whatever worries we have at the door, and to take a moment to give and dedicate this time to openness to God. evening, we use a very short scripture passage, obviously, but I want to focus us even more narrowly yet. Let's just look at that first sentence. The community of believers were of one heart and one mind. Now imagine that. Imagine that with me. The community of believers were of one heart and one mind. What would that have looked like? What can it mean for us? You know, could it be that, could that ever be a description of us? Can you imagine that? Could that be possible? Can you imagine that being of one heart and one mind would be how people would describe our parishes? Maybe could they would describe our faith communities in this way. Can you imagine that? How good is your imagination? You know, those early chapters in the Acts of the Apostles talk about a time in the church immediately after Pentecost. And the apostles that we hear, are, they're on fire with the power of God. You know, and they're very effective witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, both in their words and their preaching, but also in their deeds, the miracles that they were working. And the community of believers will see in their witness, and the community of believers was growing. Their witness was effective. People were coming to join the community of faith, becoming one with the, the other apostles and the other believers. Now, I like to think of this, these early chapters in the uh, Acts of the Apostles as kind of a description of the honeymoon period of the church. Because at the time when we read it, it sounds like everything was perfect. 
that, that, that there were no, no, no troubles at all. Everything was just exactly the way Jesus would want it to be. Well, the scholars tell us that the description we read is more of a presentation of the spiritual and theological ideals than a historical account. You know, that early communities of faith, they had their own share of problems, and the problems came from outside and but also inside. You know, as Jews observant of the law, they were struggling to make sense of how their belief in Jesus was changing all of their religious customs. And when the apostle Paul was successful in his preaching, they were struggling to make sense of you know, what does it mean that all of these Gentiles, these people we called outsiders, are suddenly insiders? These people who were outsiders are now a part of our faith community. That didn't happen easily. That we can imagine, can't we? That didn't happen easily. You know, these difficulties are well documented. So what does it mean when we say that that early community of believers were of one heart and one mind? Well, let me, let me start by telling you what it doesn't mean, okay? It doesn't mean that everybody agreed with each other. It doesn't mean that everyone thought in the same way about the issues that were facing the community at the time. But I think what it does mean is that to be of one heart and to be of one mind is to be in communion with one another. I love that word. To be in communion with one another. It's so rich in meaning. I mean, we speak about receiving communion when we receive Eucharist, and, and we do. You know, to receive Eucharist is to literally, not just symbolically, it's to become one with God. God becomes a part of, of who we are. You know, Eucharist brings us into a union with God that God hopes will transform us to be believers who are of one heart and mind with God. You know, loving God as God loves us. You know, the communion that we receive with God in Eucharist is truly great news. It's good news. But there's also a challenging invitation. You know, it's, that gift is given to us with a divine hope of how we are to receive it. That, that gift is given to us with the divine hope that we become what we have received that we, who we see, become the body of Christ. You know, if I am in communion with God, and I'm of one heart and one mind with God, then as a believer, it requires that I be of one heart and one mind with all others who are in communion with Jesus, right? You know, that's the theological ideal that we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. That's what I spoke about last night. Communion with God requires that, I be in commun that we be in communion with one another. It's simply, it's simply true. Nothing else can make sense. I can't be in communion with God and not be in communion with you. And the other early believers understood that. You know, the gen as the Gentiles will receive, if they believe that if the Gentiles received the same Spirit of God that they had received in Pentecost, they accepted that that same Spirit was given to them as given to the Gentiles, and that required that the Spirit would bring them into a unity that would be one of one heart and one mind. You know, so we might find it hard to imagine that our faith communities are to be of one heart and one mind, but what's important is that's what God imagines for us. You know, we know that we live in these extremely polarizing times. You know, we are polarized in society in the secular world, but tonight we also think especially how we are polarized as a church. You know, I'm not going to depress you with the laundry list of evidence of this, okay? But I think we can see how battling ideologies, differing spiritualities, the way we nuance our belief in what church is, we can see how this makes it difficult to for us to be in communion as believers. But the word for a group of people in communion, a group of people of one heart and one mind, is community. It is not communiformity. To be in communion with one another doesn't mean that we're always going to agree with one another. 
doesn't mean that we're all going to live our faith in lockstep with one another. But what it does mean, the differences aren't going to disappear. But what it means is that we are of one heart and one mind in our commitment to stay in right relationship with one another. That's our commitment. We will stay in right relationship with one another. We will maintain that relationship that comes through our love and the Spirit of God first to us, but it's given to all. And on a practical level, I think what this means is that it's okay if you and I don't agree with one another about something. It's okay with us that we might have a judgment about how the other person is acting. But if our judgment brings us to the point where it damages our relationship and our ability to stay in relationship with one another, if our judgment takes the other out of communion with us, then we do that knowing that when we sever that relationship, we damage our relationship to God. There is no love of God without love of David. There's no communion. We can't authentically claim communion with God and not have communion with others that are in communion with God. You know, and especially in those times when things are difficult, when we our differences appear with this sharp, hard edges, then we really have to be mindful of our commitment to remain in right relationship. We have to be mindful of our commitment to remain in relationship with one another. And we have to work at maintaining that relationship. That's what it means to be a community of believers of one heart and one mind. And our commitment to be this kind of community of believers needs to be nurtured and strengthened. You know, we need to communicate with one another in a manner that is respectful and nurturing of our communion. We have to communicate in a manner that honors our communion so that we can grow and strengthen our community. That's what we're here to do this evening. So here's the process we're going to follow. As you came in, you were given a little color. We're going to go into these small groups, and in these small groups, we're going to create a safe place to share our faith and to share our hopes. And that process is simply called listening circles. It's a methodology that we use in the Ministry of Reconciliation, and it's a simple process where we use ritual to help us to communicate. Because let's face it, too often when we have differences, we have forgotten how to talk to one another and maintain our relationship. So we're gonna use these listening circles, this, these rituals to help us to communicate what we hold in our hearts and our minds. Now, I'm going to explain briefly how they work, okay? Don't stress about this, okay? In each group, there is somebody who already knows this and is going to repeat it to you, okay? But I want you just to have the, the instructions because they're also going to be followed in the online group in some, in, 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 in some ways. So the rooms have been prepared. You have a room assigned. We are going to create some social distance. As you come in, you have a chance to use some hand sanitizer. We've got some social distancing spaces. We can. People are going to keep their masks on. There's a circle keeper who is there to maintain the circle, who knows what you need to do, so you don't need to worry about it too much. They'll help you help this to go smoothly. But there are some guidelines to guide us, some values that we want to affirm in our, our time together. Simply. We have to agree that we're going to speak truthfully from our heart, that we're going to speak and listen with respect. We promise that we will maintain confidentiality about the stories we hear because it's safer for people to tell their stories when they know they aren't going to be repeated by somebody else. We're, no one is going to ever be forced to speak or to share, but everyone is going to have the opportunity and to be invited. To help us to remember this, these, these values, we're going to have a simple talking piece. Tonight we're going to use this talking piece. We're going to talk about our hope. And this talking piece simply will be passed from person to person around the circle. The person who holds the hope, who holds the talking piece, has the floor. 
They're the only one allowed to speak while they hold the talking piece. When they finish, they will give it to the one on their left. That person has their opportunity, and it will go around the circle. Different people have more time, need more time to think before they speak. That's okay. Not everybody may want to speak. That's okay. It's okay to pass, to simply say, okay, thank you, I pass. And at the end of that time around the circle, you'll, you'll be given a second chance if you want. You don't have to use it, but you'll be invited if you want to speak, you'll have that chance. We aren't going to be discussing anything. We're not going to be trying to come to an agreement about anything. No decisions are going to be made in these circles tonight. This is a simple ritual of communication for the sake of being in communion with one another. To be in right relationship with one another. As I said, somebody will keep the circle on track. They're going to help you to remember the values and guidelines and how to use the talking piece. They have a couple of questions that they're going to pose and you'll go around the circle and have a chance to, to talk about them. Okay? Don't stress. Okay? It's all, it's all under control. Okay? We plan to end from the groups, so we're not going to come back here. The groups can decide when they're finished, but we're thinking about an hour maybe. Uh, but it's you guys decide in, in your groups. I'll say goodbye to those at home now because we're going to shift now to our breakout groups here. I want to thank you for being a part of our community here. You're not just here virtually, you're here spiritually. And we're very grateful for the way you have participated with us tonight in this part. And I wish you a good conversation, a good dialogue, a real sense of community uh, in the communication you do with each other in the circle. Sean will now shift you to your groups. Uh, to give us some, some logistics, uh, Linda's going to tell us some um, movements. Please. The logistics are very simple. If I gave you a yellow dot, you'll be back in the corner here with Father Ken. If I gave you a red or blue dot, you're over at Trinity Center. If it's a red dot, you're in the first room on the right. If it's a blue dot, you're in the second room on the right. I'll be over there to guide you. I'm going to go over there right now. So, whenever you're ready, Father. Let us go. Thank you. Uh, quick announcement. Tomorrow evening, we're meeting back over at St. Joe for the celebration of Eucharist at 7 o'clock. Hope to see you all again then.